reality, captured in user-friendly symbols and processed for understanding. The Idea Channel. The main problem with, with economics is that most people really don't know what they're talking about as far as economics goes. As a private citizen, I guess I'm ashamed to tell you that I have very little knowledge of the economy or the economy of the United States. Well, I just go by what I read in the magazines and what I see in the media. I mean, uh, whatever they say, I have to go by. I have no thought of it on my own. Uh, economists uh, could be very effective if they didn't let their jobs get involved in politics. I think if they could keep politics separate from economy, an economist can make a big difference. I would like the security of someone on top telling me what to do, and yet the adult in me is saying, when they do come out from on top to say what we're going to do, it's the little guy who has no money, who has no power, who gets front on. A lot of promises are made to our people, but people are still starving and living in all kinds of horrible ways, and I, I find it difficult to accept the fact that things can't move faster than they move. So I really have no confidence. I've lost my faith. I'm Marina Whitman, and tonight on this Economically Speaking special, we look at the state of economics with two of its most eminent practitioners, Walter Heller is Regents Professor of Economics at the University of Minnesota. He served as Chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors under President Kennedy and acted as advisor to President Johnson. A widely published author, Professor Heller contributes regularly to both the Wall Street Journal and Time Magazine. Milton Friedman is Professor of Economics at the University of Chicago and a Senior Research Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1976. Professor Friedman is the author of more than 20 books and writes a regular column in Newsweek. Although he has never accepted a full-time government position, he has served as an advisor to many political figures, including Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan. And before we get into a discussion of why you two particular economists disagree, uh, let's take a look at what one young student has to say about the two schools of thought and what the nature of the disagreements are. Half of economics is the measurement and the statistics. The other half is the beliefs and the values involved in economics, which I feel is the most important part. Everyone places different values on unemployment, on inflation, on recession. Someone who's a monetarist may say that you may have, it's better off to go through a recession and a lot of unemployment so that you don't go through a lot of inflation. Or as the Keynesian may say, no, that's not true. You should, you know, you may have to go through a bad recession for five years and put 20 million people out of work to, uh, you know, get rid of inflation. Well, is that a fair statement about what you disagree about, Milton? No, I don't believe it's a fair statement about what we disagree about at all. I think it's an understandable statement. I can see that many people would get that impression, but I don't believe it's I don't believe it's a correct statement uh, because I believe the uh, difference in values that is important in that particular issue is not a difference between unemployment and inflation. It's partly a difference of time perspective, whether you look a long time ahead or whether you look only in the immediate future. And it's partly a difference uh, of scientific judgment. Those of us like myself who believe that it is urgent to follow policies which will slow down inflation, even though a side effect of those policies will be a higher level of unemployment temporarily, believe that if you don't follow that policy, the end result will be even worse. You'll get more unemployment. We believe, and again, maybe we're wrong, but this is a factual judgment, a scientific judgment, not a value judgment. The only choice this country faces at the moment, given the past mistakes, is between having higher unemployment while slowing down inflation, or having still higher unemployment while increasing inflation. That unfortunately, there isn't a good choice ahead. That once you've gotten the economy sick, there's no way you can immediately emerge into a healthy state. And I would say that the major differences 
among those of us who argue for a steady policy of restraint, not a sudden shock, but a steady policy of restraint, and those who argue for continued stimulation is either in the time perspective or in the scientific judgment about the consequences. But not in the values. Walter, how do you feel about that? Differently, of course. Uh, I, uh, let, let me say two things, first of all. I noticed the young man uh, on the uh, screen a moment ago tended to identify uh, monetarism with conservatism. Uh, that isn't a necessary no, uh, that correlation isn't. at all. The not. fact that the Chicago Twins of monetarism and laissez-faire happened to be born together was a sort of a historical accident. But I don't want to accept the view that laissez-faire is conservatism. It isn't. It's liberalism in the true sense of believing in freedom. Oh, well, the now true we're... conservatives today are people like yourself who are back in the New Deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to be called a conservative now and then. But uh, the, uh, you know, you could be a monetarist and believe that, oh, uh, that the Federal Reserve should be pulling the levers all the time. And, uh, sure, you Let's use a different term. The question is of being an activist in, dis in, in uh, fine-tuning monetary and fiscal policy, or in, if you don't like that word, an activist in the discretionary use of an monetary... An activist versus a pacifist? Well, not pacifist isn't the right thing. It's a question of whether your emphasis is on the day-to-day -day activities that you engage in, on pushing the monetary button a little harder now and the fiscal button a little By harder By you, you now mean the government. I mean the mm -hmm. government or governmental officials, or whether your policy is one of trying to set forth a set of rules and operating according to rules rather than authority. Now, I think that's a much more fundamental that distinction. Is a, that that is a fundamental d distinction, and you've always uh, been uh, a little distrustful of human beings, it seems to me, in uh, positions of authority. I've been and very trustful of them. Uh, I've known exactly what I could count on them to do, mess things up. <laughs> that's showing trust, not lack of trust. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's your definition. But uh, the, uh, yeah, and there are those distinctions, and I think one ought to recognize them, uh, Marina, namely, that you may differ on theory uh, and uh, analysis, you may differ on facts, you may differ on interpretation, uh, you may differ in values, and uh, it is true uh, that Milton Friedman, uh, unlike myself, feels that you ought to set things going, in effect, automatically, not accept feedback information, uh, which I believe you should, uh, if uh, the economy uh, and if your analysis, if the facts, provide uh, some indications that you ought to change course uh, because of some external events, whether it's a uh, jump in the OPEC oil price or whether it's because suddenly people uh, have a surge of consumer spending or uh, maybe because uh, business gets its animal spirits up and uh, puts in a lot of investment. My feeling is that it's the better part of valor, better part of common sense, and better for the economy if there is someone uh, at uh, the command post of uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy who says, oh yes, I'll take that information into account and I'll change signals because the economy has changed. Isn't there a particular problem in economics, or maybe not? Uh, can you have such a thing as value-free economic analysis? You cannot. I, I doubt very much that there are any value-free economists. But that doesn't mean that there cannot be value-free economics. Whatever my values are, before I, as an economist, want to see something done, I would like to know what the results are. And the question of what will be the effect of doing such and such is a factual question, and I may not get the right answer. And I may be biased in my interpretation of the answer by my values, but in principle, that question is a scientific question which has no values in it. Although it's awfully hard to comb all values, even out of our scientific judgments and analyses, because you know, you're starting with a certain framework, uh, let's say a market system, that itself expresses a value. But uh, I think one thing we economists owe our audiences and our students and uh, those whom we advise is a sharp differentiation between where we're talking science, where we really are saying, well now, we think at this point uh, we, uh, in, in trying to reduce unemployment, for example, inflation accelerates versus, which might be called sort of a pivot point, uh, versus saying, yeah, but I don't want to settle for that as my goal. My goal is value charged. I think that we ought to uh, get to a much lower uh, level of unemployment. And I think that we don't do that very well. We often 
in the, uh, if not in the heat of battle, but uh, even in teaching and so forth, uh, we don't sharply enough differentiate where we're charging a particular statement with values and where we are making uh, essentially a scientific judgment. We try, but uh, time and again, I think we uh, slip a little out. Well, we, don't, so. we don't always make yeah. it. Back at the beginning of this discussion, Milton, you made quite a specific statement. You said that we have only, only two choices. We can either restrain the economy and get inflation down and tolerate more unemployment temporarily, or we can try to stimulate the economy and in the end get both more inflation and more unemployment. Now, Walter, I know there are many occasions, at least, on which you disagree with Milton. I guess this may be one of them. Uh, uh, you would say, I gather, and I don't want to put words into your mouth, that no, we can stimulate the economy and thereby reduce unemployment without, down the road, getting both more inflation and, and more unemployment. Well, now, now, that is a question of fact. That is Presumably, a question of fact. this kind of disagreement between you two, and there are many others of this sort, should be amenable to resolution by observation and testing and something that scientists would call proof. Is it or isn't it? And if it is, how come you're still disagreeing? Well, yeah, let's try to, let's try to uh, disentangle that. Um, I think empirically, I think as a matter of fact, we can show that in the recovery from the deepest recession since the Great Depression, namely the 73 to April 75 recession, we had stimulus from tax cuts uh, and from uh, relatively easy money and so forth that translated not into higher prices, but into higher production and more jobs and so forth. The record of the past, uh, of the three years from April 75 to April 78 pretty well uh, shows that. The inflation rate stayed uh, pretty steady. Uh, the uh, rate of uh, employment uh, rose uh, dramatically, and so on. Then there's the next question, and this goes more to the heart of what Milton was saying a while ago. Uh, what about the use of restrictive monetary and fiscal policy to try to squeeze inflation out of the economy? Now there we've had... Oh, but you've got to stop before you get to that, because let's keep the discussion orderly. Because you are... Uh, you, are try you are saying, well, I'm going to take the first effect of the policy and not look at later effects. There is no quarrel or dispute between you and me, or between those who analyze things different ways, that the initial effects of a more expansive policy will be felt in output, not in inflation. The problem is that what you are now dealing with is a hangover from precisely those expansive policies. The argument, the, the scientific uh, proposition that underlies the view I said is that there's a difference in the time lag between the, t the difference in the time which it takes for expansive monetary or fiscal policy to affect output and the time which it takes to affect inflation. That in the history of the United States and of countries like the United States, it has taken something like six to nine months from a more expansionary policy. In 1975, it was even less than that. Be, it's taken between six and nine months on the average before a more expansionary policy affects output. It increases incomes, and to begin with, that certainly does take the form of more output and more employment. But that's a first effect. We have to carry it all the way through. The, in, at the same time, it sets in motion forces, which later will come out in inflation, so that the evidence from history for the United States and countries like that is that it takes another 18 months before it comes out in inflation. So if we take those three years, inflation actually came down during the first year and a half of the expansion. But it came down as a result of what had happened two years earlier. The very monetary restraints that had produced the severe recession had a carryover. And they enabled you for an interim period of a year and a half to have both increasing employment and reduced inflation. But then beginning in the fall of 76, December 76, you started to get the delayed effects of the more expansionary policies. Now again, if we turn to the other side, which you were going to, of using restrained policy, you will agree that you'll also have those different effects. Well, we, we, this is a place, Marina, where we really do read the evidence uh, differently, and uh, I think our audience should be uh, very much aware of it. Uh, what has happened uh, in these three years, uh, actually, uh, from 75 to 78, uh, 
was that we still had a policy with a great deal of slack in it, a lot of unemployment, a lot of unused You capacity. mean an economy with a lot of the slack in it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, and uh, inflation got stuck. Inflation got stuck right around it the didn't five get to stuck six at percent all. level. Inflation it dropped, fell, dropped. It dropped, Milton, uh, just, uh, just a darn minute as the expression goes. Uh, in 1974, 75, we had ferocious double digit inflation right. touched off by a 400% jump in the uh, oil price and a 40% jump in food prices in two and a half years. And, you can't uh, explain inflation by a rise in prices. Inflation is a rise in prices. Non-food and non-fuel uh, commodity prices up 100%. Uh, we took off uh, wage and price controls, so we had a pop-up effect after the controls came off. And we had a devaluation of the dollar of about 20%, which raised import prices. Now, almost all of those forces that led to uh, the double-digit inflation of that period are outside uh, the, the uh, essential control or realm or influence of uh, fiscal policy and monetary policy. Uh, you can say, well, if you didn't have the quantity of money uh, to uh, validate those price increases, you wouldn't have had the price increases. No, but you would have had a depression. I, you know, I really think this discussion so far has established a couple of things. And one is that two leading economists really do interpret the evidence differently. And second is that there is no general and commonly agreed theory of what causes inflation. Oh, I don't but believe that's right. Go slowly. We do interpret the evidence differently. But there is an accepted agreement about what ultimately causes inflation. There's no, di there's no agreement. Notice the word ultimately. Right. Now, that's, we, no ought, we, really ought to, we really ought to look at that a little more closely because uh, that is rather fundamental to the whole question of what you use by way of instruments to try to cure inflation. But go, go to that question. There is no disagreement among economists about this proposition, and I think uh, Walter will agree, that you cannot get a long continued inflation without a rapid growth in the quantity of money without a, let me not say rapid, without a correspondingly, roughly correspondingly, not precise, but a roughly correspondingly rapid growth in the quantity of money. Yeah, and then you have to move to the question but, of... But you would agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I agree, agree with, with the that. doctrine of original sin. Uh, this is not know, the doctrine... I don't think we can go back to the Garden of Eden. This is not the doctrine of original sin, because the fact is that a very large fraction of non-economists do not believe in it, do not understand it, and that while economists always express agreement with it, when it comes to actual policy conclusions, they often act as if they didn't. But Milton, the reason that the layman does not accept it and does not agree with it is a perfectly good one, because in the real world, that's not the way things work. What happens is you build, you, you have certain institutional changes, things get into the uh, warp and woof of the economy. Let's take the uh, wage price or price wage spiral. Uh, let's take uh, OPEC uh, oil prices. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that cartel, which has lasted far longer than Milton Friedman thought it would, uh, is, is a fact of life. Now, you can say, well, but we'll just slow down the rate of increase in the money supply, and those things will all take care of themselves in the long run. But here I am a Keynesian. Uh, in the long run, we are all dead. So what Those you're things are saying, mostly Walter, upstream from So what you're saying, policy. I gather, is that you would agree with Milton's statement as he made it, but you would also argue, and I think this is the big difference between you here, that you can get causes of inflation initially, which are something other than printing too much money. That, is not that only you can get answer? causes of higher prices. Well, and let's not let's just uh, lay it out this way: it causes that. Uh, monetary policy simply can't ignore. Uh, when there are two or three bad crop years, there isn't really very much that uh, the Federal Reserve can do about the, the weather in the Great Plains. I know but we certainly have uh, not exhausted this argument, but I would like to move on because I don't want people to have the idea that there's only disagreements among economists and talk a little bit about the areas in which economists do agree, which are also very important. And I think I'd like to have from the two of you what you think the important areas or the nature of the important agreement among economists is. Well, of course, Milton and I have both uh, uh, dealt uh, with this question, and we agree that, surprisingly enough, given uh, our discussion up to this point, that there are more areas of agreement than disagreement. Uh, Milton and I uh, uh, were uh, in a, an encounter about a, a decade ago in a debate at, in New York at the uh, 
Solomon Brothers lecture at New York University. And I recall so vividly, and I think it's being somewhat uh, duplicated tonight, I recall so vividly, Milton, when uh, we were in front of that large audience down at NYU and talking about uh, monetary and fiscal policy, about unemployment, about inflation, about growth. We were, uh, you know, we were at swords points. We were at each other's throats. Uh, that, those are the great questions of what we, in our uh, jargon, call macroeconomics. And then afterwards, we repaired to the 21 Club with a small percentage of the audience. I guess we had 60 or 70 people. It was just a question and answer session. And almost all the questions were about such things as, uh, uh, well, the structural or what we are microeconomic questions, questions of the marketplace, like uh, what do you think about antitrust policy? What about protectionism? What about uh, negative income taxes? What about uh, tax exemption of uh, municipal securities? And in almost every case, one or the other of us said uh, so-and-so, and then the other one would say, I agree, much to the puzzlement and amazement of our audience. And at the end of the evening, I remember, Milton, you turned to me and you said, well, Walter, tonight we showed him that economics is a discipline <laughs> after all. Well, I say that by way of uh, saying that on questions of uh, government regulation, on questions of antitrust, on questions of tariffs, and so forth, there's a tremendously wide area of agreement, even on some of these questions that we've been seemingly disagreeing on, on uh, in the macro uh, end of the field, uh, we do have a certain disciplinary base that, uh, on which we agree. Well, even in these areas, I quite agree. My experience, more generally, has always been that if you put three or four economists together with a group of other people, I don't care whether they're sociologists or political scientists or they're physicists, and take the economist from as widely dispersed views in economics as you can, get into any discussion, even of inflation or of monetary mm -hmm. and fiscal policy, and within 15 minutes, the economists will all be one group against everybody, everybody else. Everybody else. It's, it's us against them. <laughs> and does that really cover the whole profession? That is, aren't there some people in the profession who really would reject the whole analytical apparatus that all three of us share in common, who would sort of argue that we're looking through the wrong end of the telescope, if you like? There undoubtedly are. These are a the, very the small radicals, number, the, the radicals on the one hand, the, mar the extreme Marxists on the other. Of course, I say extreme Marxists because Marx accepted most of this discipline. In fact, in the area of monetary theory, he was on my side rather than Waller's. He was a strict <laughs> quantity yeah, theorist. That, that's why I'm not a Marxian. <laughs> <laughs> well, neither am I, but, you know, uh, uh, as I was saying before, we got to uh, recognize science wherever science is and mustn't let it be determined by who says it. I was involved in a, an interdisciplinary discussion the other day, and finally a, a good friend of mine who turned to me and said in absolute exasperation, the trouble with economists, Marina, is you insist on assuming that people always behave rationally. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that's nonsense. <laughs> what about that? <laughs> we don't insist on people, uh, that people always behave rationally. What we insist on is that it's not, you're, not very, you're not able to predict random irrational behavior. And therefore, the only kind of behavior that you can hope to predict is behavior that has some regularity. And one individual may behave any way at all, but we're not really concerned with individual behavior. That's the role of the psychologist or of the physician. We're concerned with group behavior. And if I take a lot of people, many of them may behave in all sorts of crazy ways, but the group as a whole, the common tendency, the thing that's going to come out of it, is something which will be as if it were rational behavior. I think Milton's a little bit overstated our case. Uh, we have an awful lot, uh, a great deal more difficulty isolating the impact of a particular uh, move, private or public, on the course of the economy. Uh, the, the physicist uh, is, is in a little better position than we are to do so. The, the method is scientific. Right. The material we're working with has witnessed uh, the difference between us on interpreting certain economic events. Uh, the material we're working with is a lot more difficult, but I think that's important to... Uh, well, I know. think that may well be. I, as I said, uh, uh, to say that something is a science doesn't mean that you know the answers. No, no. That's very right. different, and there are many things on which we do not. We're not able to make very good predictions. But on the question that Marina raised, we can only hope to have some success at predictions insofar as we are able to find a systematic pattern expressed in the average behavior of groups of people, each of whom separately may behave in a very erratic and unpredictable way. Yeah, we are saved by the law of large right. numbers, there's no question. Right.
The public has lost some of its faith in economists in recent years, but there are some very useful things that economists can do. Let's see what Wall Street economist Larry Kudlow has to say about that. Economists have, in the past decade or so, promised too much, and thus the higher the expectation, the more or the greater the disappointment when we can't deliver on promises that oughtn't to have been made in the first place. But I do think economists can play a very useful role in, first of all, decomposing problems into specific areas that can be understood. And second of all, we can predict trends in markets, whether it's labor markets or product markets or financial markets. We can predict trends. And third of all, I think we can offer uh, government policymakers uh, a useful framework of analysis with some accompanying uh, prescription to deal with problems. Yes, I think there's a, a terrific contribution that can be uh, made in this area. Would you, Milton and Walter, agree with that particular list of the useful functions economists can perform? Well, I'd say, first of all, it's rather limited, uh, but uh, basically, uh, if he says that economists are useful in uh, explaining options, in explaining the uh, costs and benefits of different options, of quantifying uh, for the policymaker in business or in government uh, what's involved uh, in a particular change in policy, uh, yes, I would agree with that. The problem of policy is twofold. One is what do you want to accomplish, and the second is how do you accomplish it. Economists have very little to say about what you want to accomplish. That is the question of values. That's where the philosopher, the uh, anybody, everybody is an expert. But and economists, it's, it's a job for the much maligned political process in a, in a democracy, isn't it? To decide what it is you want to accomplish? It certainly is. But where economists can make a special contribution is not in telling you what you want to accomplish, but how to accomplish it, or how not to accomplish it. Yeah, there is example, no doubt that uh, people... If, excuse me, Milton, but sure. uh, a point on which, again, I think you and I agree. Um, uh, for example, if the body politic feels, uh, as your, uh, one of your mentors, Henry Simons, put it, that the present distribution of income is distinctly evil and unlovely, that's not a judgment we should make. But if they tell us it's distinctly evil and unlovely and they want to correct it, presumably the economist can help them, can help the policymaker find a way out. Well, let's take a very much simpler matter. If you want to know how to solve the problems of shortages and uh, uh, lack of availability of oil and gas, we can sure tell them that the way to do it is not to have a set of price ceilings and arbitrary allocations, not to set up a 10,000-man uh, Department of Energy. Now, uh, you may still want to set it up for other reasons, but it won't achieve that objective. We can't say you shouldn't set up the Department of Energy. What we can say is, if you insist on holding down the prices, fixing the prices of all kinds of gasoline, unleaded, leaded, whatnot, you are going to get yourselves into trouble. You're going to have certain predictable effects. As long as we're on examples, let's take an even simpler one. Let's take the minimum wage. Yeah, minimum now, wage is an excellent uh, one. As a human being, you know, I might feel it's terrible to pay somebody less than uh, $2.90 an hour. You know? But as an economist, and <laughs> I don't want to say economists aren't human beings, but, I, uh, but as an economist, <laughs> I would have to say, and Milton and I would agree, that uh, if you increase the minimum wage from 265 to 290, this will cause so and so much inflation. So maybe you know 0 0.2, 0 0.3 on the cost of living index. And so and so much unemployment too. I More suspect. important, so much unemployment. Uh, so it, you're it, saying, I think the two of the the economists can certainly do two things. One, they can help define the issues or break down a problem into parts which can be managed analytically, and they can define the trade-offs or what, they, what economists sometimes call the opportunity costs. And they can set up the options. You know, we've been talking about what economists can do, but let's get to the bottom line. Do you think that, say, over the past decade or any time period you want to pick, uh, what economists have done and what economists have advised and the advice that's been carried out has helped or hurt the, the American economy? Well, the problem with that is the difficulty of distinguishing between what they've advised and what has, in fact, been done. I think one of the m there are two main problems, as I see it, in this. One is that I think economists, we have overpromised. We have professed to be able to do more than we could by we, I don't mean each individual one among us, but the economics profession as a whole has given the public the impression 
that the problem of employment, of stability and so on had been solved, that we had fine, delicate tools by which we could push this button and push that button, and we could keep the economy on a steady keel. And I think that we are now reaping the harvest of that in the form of the extraordinarily difficult inflationary problem we follow, in the form of the reduced rate of real growth in the economy, real productivity growth. I think we have done a great deal of harm as a profession by overpromising. Well, On no, the other I, hand, I, I, we I, don't deserve all the blame we've gotten because of the fact that so often political considerations have overridden economic advice. So, so you're really saying, I think, that the attempts, if you like, to, to fine-tune the economy actually made the relationship uh, but among inflation and growth and unemployment deteriorate over Absolutely. the last 10 or 20 years. Absolutely. I bet those are fighting words to Walter, and I'd oh, like to know well, what he has uh, to say about first that. First of all, fine-tune is a fighting word, all because right, we that, were, we were very much phrase, misinterpreted yeah. mm -hmm. in the mid 60s as being fine tuners maybe we are by Milton's definition but, but you were fine were, tuners what are you kidding yourselves uh, the 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 concept that you know we were sitting there at a console where we felt we could uh, control every little movement in the economy is quite wrong uh, no one ever had that conception all you have uh, to do is read your the reports of the council of economic advisors to see that that was exactly the conception which you had well, not every there, minute there, you didn't do have to, right we just day. have to agree to dis disagree on that milk let me just pursue one uh, sort of uh, point that you've been stressing. We should take the long perspective, not just the short one. All right, let's take the long perspective. Let's look at the pre-war and post-war period. Mm -hmm. uh, pre-war period, the world uh, in, of the 30s, very much in chaos, 19% average unemployment in the United States for a 10-year period. Uh, post-war period, vastly lower levels of unemployment, rapidly, much more rapid growth. Uh, in other words, a world that operated at much more than, uh, at a much higher percentage of its potential. Now, among the major variables was that before the war, we had very little of the, uh, what should we say, modern economic management. And after the war, there were the role of the economists was much greater. In that long run perspective, uh, the combination of uh, activism, which is the word you want to use, Keynesianism perhaps that uh, I want to work, use, uh, and the role of that in governmental policy has a, the, the correlation is unquestionable. Yes, I was going to I ask you that, to. Walter. You said in your Friedman-Heller debate, if I can call it that, of 10 years ago, that there is a strong correlation historically between the use of active activist monetary and fiscal policy and a high employment and relatively stable economy. Do you still, after all that's happened between 68 and 78, do you still agree with that, or would you modify it in any way? Well, first of all, let's start with 48 to 78, and of course I have to agree. Now, uh, when we talk about the uh, instabilities of the 70s, I'm not about to fold my tent and say, uh, uh, economists uh, are responsible for that instability, and economists know nothing about how to cope with it, not at all. Uh, do economists uh, bear some responsibility? Uh, do economists uh, have an easy answer? Well, the answer to the first is yes, and the answer to the second is uh, no. We don't have but any I've easy gotta, answers to I've this gotta, I've got to object any to the easy whole... Answers, e any easy answers are just wrong. But I've got to object to the whole historical picture that Walter painted because it's wrong. The fact is that the 1920s and 30s were a period of a highly activist policy. The, the, in the United States, the key thing was the enactment of the Federal Reserve Act in 1913, which assigned to the monetary authorities responsibility for monetary policy. And they were a very activist group. You read what they were saying in the 1920s, and it sounds like the reports of the Council of Economic Advisors in the 1960s about the capacity of the Federal Reserve with its new tools of monetary controls to keep the economy on an even keel. In my opinion, the Great Depression of the 1930s, and this is not an opinion which I come to lightly and I'm not willing to document, was caused precisely by the mistakes which the Federal Reserve made. So far from the 1930s being an evidence of the need for activism, it's about as strong evidence as you can find for how much harm discretionary authorities can do when they have in their hands so powerful a weapon as control of the money supply when they produced a decline in the quantity of money of one-third from 1929 to 1933. If you really want to get a period 
of comparing activism with non-activism, you have to have an even longer historical perspective. You have to take the period before 1913 and the period since 1913 and there. You know, I hate to have to stop this because I think we could go on for quite a while talking about the new ideas in the profession. But we have an audience in the studio with us today, including both economists and non-economists, and they've been waiting very patiently during our discussion. But now we'd like to give them a chance to ask some questions. Yes, I'm Laura Tyson from the Department of Economics at Berkeley. Um, Professor Friedman stated in his discussion that there is a consensus view among economists about the causes of inflation. And I would like to ask both Professor Friedman and Professor Heller if they think there's a consensus view among economists about the causes of unemployment. And also, uh, are there developing any new theories of unemployment these days? And what policy implications might these new theories have? Well, that's a very big question, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give any kind of an answer, because I believe almost all economists would agree that it's very misleading to talk about unemployment as a single magnitude. Unfortunately, the public at large tends to look at one number, the percentage unemployed, as if somehow it corresponded to something it doesn't. It makes an enormous amount of difference whether the person who is regarded as unemployed is a college student who is trying to get a part-time job and can't get it, or is the head of a family uh, in which he's a main breadwinner. Talking about the unemployment numbers, I think it's worth another moment to recognize that in some ways the present unemployment, the official unemployment statistic, may overstate unemployment. In other ways, it drastically understates it. It doesn't include the people who uh, have dropped out of the labor market, the dropouts, the discouraged workers who are simply not counted. It doesn't include the three and a half million part-time workers who are looking for full-time work. In other words, it does not define the whole reservoir of unemployed labor looked at just as an economic uh, concept. Uh, but, uh, of course, when you get down to proximate policy, is what do you do about unemployment? What do you do about inflation? There, uh, no matter what our basic analysis may be in terms of, say, the long-run underlying supply of money and so forth, I think you'd find some rather substantial differences in our answers. Yes. I have a concern that relates to employment. Um, as I'm sure all of us know that unemployment among minorities is very high. And given the fact that the Bakke decision has had a great deal of influence on the educational opportunities. And today I heard further that it's spilling over into employment. I'm wondering what do you see as the possibility of our society making an effort to uh, find a way that minorities can better participate in the economic structure of this society? Well, I would be very glad to answer that because I believe that the major handicap to minorities are the governmental measures that are enacted in the name of helping the minorities. I have often said over and over again that the most anti-Negro books on the law, uh, law, the most anti-Negro law on the books is the minimum wage rate. The second most important source of minority problems, in my opinion, is the lousy schooling that is available to youngsters in the ghetto. And the reason that schooling is so bad is because it's provided by the government. And what minorities, what we need to do to have more opportunities for minorities is to have more opportunities for everybody. To give minorities the same ability to control their own lives that we give to other groups. I believe that if you really wanted to do something to promote the welfare of minorities, the most effective single thing one could do, if you could get it by the school teachers, is a voucher system for schooling. That would provide minorities with an opportunity to have the same kind of control and choice over the schooling of their children as most of us are able to do. That's where the fundamental problem, I think, starts. Because what happens is we give them a double whammy. We first provide them with lousy schooling, and then when they get out of that school, ah, we say, but you can't go to work unless you are sufficiently skilled to be worth the minimum wage that's allowed to be paid. And that handicaps them doubly. I could go on, but I'm trying to suggest that you must look beyond the stated objectives of measures. Things which are enacted in the name of helping minorities often hurt the minorities. And we have to look at the actual effect of those policies and not the supposed effect. Well, on, on this point, I just have to agree, disagree with the fundamental thrust of what Milton Friedman has just said. 
Because while you can point to some cases where government uh, regulations may interfere with uh, hiring of minorities, particularly hiring of minorities at miserable uh, wages, uh, on the other hand, you can, appoint, you can point to a great deal of progress that has been made, not nearly enough, but an immense amount of progress that's been made in the opportunities that have opened to minorities and in the uh, jobs that uh, minorities now hold in terms of their, uh, as I say, their job opportunities and the actual numbers. You still have this incredible uh, youth unemployment level among non-whites. It's what, 34, 35 percent? That's a <coughs> terrible blot on the American escutcheon that has something to do with the minimum wage, but by no means everything. What you need is a full opportunity economy. You need high employment. That is the best solvent uh, because the minorities, by and large, not entirely, are the last to be hired and the first to be fired. And unless we maintain, even uh, if we don't uh, accomplish our full anti-inflation objectives, unless we maintain a high level of employment and opportunity, uh, the minorities are going to suffer. I, uh, uh, I think the proof of the pudding is in the eating, and I think the eating is very clear, as you were quite properly saying. I think you want to be aware of this kind of a device so far as the minorities are concerned. I don't want to make any, have any misunderstanding. I welcome the Bakke decision, except I think it didn't go far enough. I think that any program by government which specifically labels certain groups as getting preferential status is going to hurt those groups and not help them. Because what it means is that it establishes an, uh, establishes an official imprimatur on the idea that that group is inferior and needs special advantages. I think that what we want is not legislation for groups, but legislation for individuals. That every individual ought to have equal opportunity regardless of his color, regardless of his religion, regardless of anything else, but not in terms of his group characteristics. Before we go on to the next question, yes, Which would you identify yourself economics. before you follow up? <laughs> I am Doris Holmes from the College of Alameda. Doris Holmes from the College of Alameda, that's in Oakland area. I have one question for you, um, Dr. Friedman. Given the past history whereby people did not permit minorities to have a fair share in the educational structure nor the job market, what makes you so sure or so certain that we've had a complete change of heart and this will happen? We have not had a complete change of heart, that's my whole point. Well, how My can whole you point is that if you haven't had a complete change of heart, these same measures, which are enacted in the name of helping the minorities, are going to be employed by the people who haven't had a change of heart to prevent their having the effects that they claim they have. And that what we need is not a situation in which you depend on majority views in favor of minorities, but in which you don't prevent that minority among us who believes that people ought to be treated as people from doing what we think right from choosing the best people. What I'm saying to you is do not depend on the vote of a majority to give you special privilege. Because but that way, what about you set privileges? up a class. You ought to have equal rights, but equal rights is not special privilege. Equal okay. rights is not the same as saying that 10% of all people hired have to be of a certain color. It's not the same as saying that there should be quotas. That isn't equal privilege for individuals, not at all. But and the people who are going to be hurt by that most are the ablest among the minorities. They are the ones who are going to be hurt. Human progress has invariably come from the ablest among groups being able to move up and help the rest of their fellows get up, not by pushing everybody up from the bottom. I, I will cease by saying that I, I must say that I disagree with you. Thank so you. Right. Yes. Barbara Vaughn with Resolve Center for Environmental Conflict Resolution. Professor Friedman, you said that an economist's job should not be to define society's goals, but rather to tell us how those goals can be reached, and that furthermore they can explain the trade-offs that are involved in those various policies. But do you think that economists really can explain the trade-offs and the costs and benefits of various policies when environmental damages, aesthetics, civil liberties, or the values of future generations might be involved? Well, if they can't, who can? Is there somebody else who can? Well, many of these questions do not admit of any good answer. Obviously, there are many questions we don't have answers for. But the question is, is there some other discipline that can offer answers to this? Are these really things that people can pull out of the air? In some cases, 
a, 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 a person who studies the issues will be able to tell you something about what evidence there is about such effects. In many cases, he may not be able to tell you anything because there's no way of knowing. Let's but take the issues are no different than they are in any other area. Let's take a specific example. You say you're with the Environmental Council? No, it's Resolve. It's Center for Environmental Conflict Resolution. It's I a see. mutual organization. Well, all right, but take the environmental problem. Uh, pollution, for example. Uh, what does pollution do? It uh, dirties the air and water. Uh, it uh, has impacts on health. Uh, and it occasionally causes people to die. Now, the economists can set up the problem in such a way that uh, the costs and benefits in terms of impact on uh, dirt, on health, on the, the cost of cleansing water for uh, human consumption and so forth, uh, that can be measured against the costs of ending that pollution. Now, when it comes to putting a value, and I think this may in part lie behind your question, when it comes to putting a value on human life, that is uh, kind of an infinite that's extremely difficult uh, for, for anyone. But in setting up the problem, Milton is quite right. Uh, the economist has a framework for doing it. There are parts of that framework for which there aren't any data, or which, the, as I say, the value of a human life, you don't know how to plug that in. Uh, and that's where a public judgment, a value judgment, is going to have to be made that's well beyond the scope of anything economics can do. Now further, as long as we're on the environmental problem for a moment, uh, one of the things the economists can do is say, well, there are better and worse ways of handling the problem. One of the worst ways is to handle it by regulation and prohibition. Well, some things have to be prohibited because they're just so uh, environmentally devastating. Uh, mercury, uh, DDT, and so forth. Milton might not, I would. But, by and large, uh, we would both feel, and I think I can speak with some confidence sure. for both of us, that you're much better off using the marketplace here and saying, well, uh, you, you know about what you want by way of uh, air quality or water quality, and then put a tax on the emissions into the air that would uh, provide an incentive through the private profit motive to get people to uh, pollute less, make pollution expensive, make depollution profitable, and you'll be able to do it through the market system rather than a conjuries of regulations that uh, result in essentially uneconomic solutions to the problem. Well, that's that's one of the examples of where economists really very much agree. Can I uh, add using one thing? prices rather than regulations. Can I add I mean, one thing to this statement of Walters, which I think all three of us agree with, and I think most of our profession would too, and that is you say that economists recoil, and I think each of us individually does, from placing a value on human life. But the fact is society is constantly, implicitly placing values on human yeah. lives. That, and I think one of the duties I, of the I, economist I would hope so. is <laughs> that's right. One of the duties of the economist is at times to force people to make these valuations explicit. Maybe that's why we're called the dismal science, because we really do, in the process of setting up a framework for decision making, saying, OK, this is the kind of valuation you have to confront, however difficult you may find it, because you're doing it implicitly anyway. And maybe the results that you get when you do it implicitly aren't the best ones, aren't the ones that society really wants to see. Yes. My name's Sam Swift. I'm a lawyer rather than an economist. Uh, there's been, I think, some agreement between the two of you that the public sort of distrusts uh, uh, economists at the risk of putting myself in the school of the, uh, uh, the fringe schools that you mentioned uh, before. Uh, mm -hmm. I might suggest that maybe it's the public who distrusts the economy and the economists who defend it rather than distrusting the economists themselves. Uh, isn't it true that the, that the existence the historical experience of the cyclical crises that we've had with unemployment and inflation um, suggests that whether it's a question of fine-tuning the economy and trying to level out those booms and bust periods, or a question of, as Mr. Friedman would suggest, of just sort of letting the economy run its course through those cycles, that we, that you two gentlemen would basically agree that those crises, those periods of recession leading into depression and periods of boom which result in inflation, are inevitable cycles of, of the system and not something that, that either one of you think can be very much can be done about 
and therefore you as economists from your various schools have really very little to offer in solution to those problems. I don't now, believe see, that's uh, right at all. Milton, here's, here's where you and I can agree. <laughs> oh, uh, here's our, here's our discipline. You can both attack. jump on your questioner. Of we we'll can, both uh, jump on them because <laughs> the problem with your discussion <clears throat> is to talk of those cycles of recession and inflation as if one was a duplicate of the other, as if there was only one kind. It makes all the difference in the world whether you have a recession or a depression like 29, 1929 to 33, which is a catastrophe by anybody's name, or whether you have a mild recession like that of, let's say, 69 to 70, or whether you have a, a more severe, but still by comparison with 29 to 33, milder recession like that of 74 to 5. Now, I think it is true that there is no human activity of any kind which proceeds in straight, strictly steady way. And I have no doubt that there will never be a possibility of having an economy or a society of any kind, whoever controls it, that will not have its ups and downs. But we would both agree that there are questions of degree and that it would, is perfectly, what we would hope, we may disagree right now about how to do it, but we would both agree that as we understand more about the economy, it should be possible to devise institutions and arrangements which would greatly reduce the amplitude of those fluctuations and get them down. You see, you're using the, the word crisis. Would you use the word crisis to refer to a recession like 69 to 70? Well, if you, if you look at it in terms of the effect on real people, I mean, you, you guys have talked a lot about statistics. Unemployment, you look at as a mechanism for resolving a problem, whereas the no, people not who are at the unemployed, not at I all. look at it a little differently. Not at all, we don't. Just as we look at unemployment in this context as a side effect of, of measures taken for very different purposes, of course it's a real human being. These are real problems. But there's a difference in magnitude. There isn't such a thing as perfection on this world. You've got to go to the next world for that. So that I go back to you. Are you going to lump into one single class? A recession like out of 69 to 70 and one like 29 to 33? Oh, absolutely not. There's okay. no way. But, well, then, th but you're still assuming the basic continuation of those uh, cyclical crises and the fact that there's virtually nothing that can be done about it except minor modifications in its severity. When you're using the word minor, I do not regard it as a minor modification in severity to eliminate episodes like 29 to 33. That's not minor in the slightest. Well, whether they've been formally eliminated, finally eliminated remains to be seen. Well, that may be. Maybe, as I say, maybe we will fail. That's a different question. But you're asking, what is our hope and expectation? And I agree that we do not believe we're going to get utopia. I regard the, the uh, big recession of 73, 74, actually ended in April uh, 75. I regard that as a pretty disastrous thing. And if you were uh, one of the three million who became unemployed in that period, and remember now, today, one percentage point of unemployment means one million people. Our labor force is 100 million right now. Uh, and if you were one of the people that, uh, well, actually uh, almost five million from the lowest unemployment to the highest unemployment, you wouldn't consider it anything but a crisis. And I think that uh, we have uh, uh, rather different evaluations of what should have been done under those circumstances. I think it was absolutely disastrous that we maintained uh, a fiscal policy that was getting, a budget policy that was getting tighter all year long in the midst, uh, in the face of that uh, high unemployment that we maintained a tight money policy, that we didn't recognize that uh, the OPEC oil potentates were sucking about $30 billion of purchasing power out of the economy per year, I think we could have moderated that. And I I, then I come back to some agreement with Milton. I do believe that in the, in the years to come, economists, for all their uh, failings and limitations, are going to find ways of moderating those swings which you cannot eliminate, but I think they can be substantially moderated. I have to get my nickels worth in here on another part of your question. You said something which is very often said to economists accusingly, you know, you guys look at the statistics, but what about real people? Well, we look at the statistics because it's the best way we know about getting information about large numbers of real people, because there are, what, 230 million Americans, and we cannot be informed on each one of them individually. But there is a difference. Let me give you the analogy of automobile accidents. When one single individual dies in an automobile accident, clearly that is the ultimate crisis for that person and his or her family. But it's not a national crisis. 
What may be a national crisis is when suddenly the number of people who die in automobile accidents rises very suddenly and stays high. Then we think perhaps we ought to do something about it in a policy sense. We are clearly not willing to institute policies that will reduce the number of deaths in automobile accidents to zero. Well, similarly, for any individual who is unemployed, it is a very real crisis. But the simple fact is, nonetheless, you can talk about whether we are having a national crisis or not, uh, depending on the size and the severity of the recession and how many millions of people are caught up in that kind of individual crisis. But what you all are agreeing on but never stating until you're finally pushed to the wall to do it is that those cyclical periods of unemployment and then inflation in, in cycles are inevitable and that it's only in a moderate way that those, pr those cycles can be ameliorated but that economists of your stripe can do nothing about can the economists, no. Can anybody else? Uh, excuse me. You said economists of our stripe. What economists can do anything about it? Well, there are different social systems. Oh, but they have the same fluctuations. If you look at detail at the records of Russia or China, you have even more extreme fluctuations. They don't show up in the same way. But don't kid yourself in supposing that you don't have ups and downs in economic productivity and well-being, in the case of Russia, in the case of China. Just look at the convulsions through which China has gone through. Just look at the, uh, my goodness, how do you, how can you look at Russia and not recognize the millions of people who were killed in the collectivization crisis of the, uh, of the uh, 1920s? Or if you look at the, fa uh, the agricultural failures and the number of people who have uh, starved to death or been in p poor condition on account of that. You are just kidding yourself if you think that somewhere in this world there is a fluctuation-free society. The plain fact is that nobody of any stripe has been able to show how you get a perfectly stable, steady, certainty kind of a world except in two places, a prison and a grave. Time has come to thank our audience and most particularly my guests Walter Heller and Milton Friedman for a discussion which I think has shed some light on the profession of economics and the fact that there are many questions we economists agree on and many problems we can help solve. But as we've seen during this past hour, there are still major issues about which economists strongly disagree. Disagreement, perhaps the most fundamental disagreement, involves the proper role of government in the economy. And one crucial problem economists have still not solved is how to achieve steady growth, high employment, and price stability all at the same time. It may be that during the optimistic period of the 1950s and early 60s, the profession did promise too much. The dream of prosperity for everyone has proved to be very elusive in the real world. But to write off economics as a failure because it hasn't solved the problem of stagflation would be like dismissing modern medicine because it has not yet found a cure for cancer. The economic shocks of the 1970s have pushed economists into the limelight. They also sent the profession into a turmoil and destroyed the old consensus, making room for new ideas and new approaches. Perhaps we'll soon see the emergence of some new grand synthesis that will reconcile the factions now at odds with each other. But given the complexities and unpredictability of human nature, it seems unlikely that economists will run out of problems to wrestle with. And given the important role of values in determining economic opinion, it seems even more unlikely that economists will ever stop disagreeing. I'm Marina Whitman. Good night. Economically Speaking was produced by WQLN Public Communications, which is solely responsible for its content. <laughs>